Sorry for those who, uh, whose English is uh, perhaps less than the Portuguese, but I'm definitely going to speak in, in English, which was agreed, so uh, uh, I'm afraid that I can't speak your native language, so uh, you'll have to do it uh, in English. Um, okay, when, uh, when I was preparing this lecture, I, I was thinking, uh, is there any image with which I can start, an image that is directly related to uh, uh, capital punishment and that I yet have not shown many times before. And I thought, yeah, that would be possible. That would actually be a work of art, uh, which we have here, a uh, work by American uh, artist uh, Sam Durant, uh, which is simply called Scaffold. Um, this one, uh, is a picture from where it was first put up, uh, installed, I should say, perhaps, for the uh, art exhibition Documenta in uh, Kassel in Germany in 2012. At first sight, you might see, you might think it's a kind of uh, a structure for uh, where children can play, and indeed children were allowed to play on it. But uh, the work scaffold actually is a kind of assemblage, uh, uh, a composite structure which uh, refers to seven. Uh, scaffolds, seven historical scaffolds from American history. Perhaps uh, let me brief, briefly mention the seven, uh, according to Sam Durant's uh, uh, American executions. The first was from John Brown, the, the abolitionist in 1859. Uh, yeah, I, I should also say that, uh, of course, that Sam Durant is an artist, so he is excused. He doesn't have like a scholar that he has to say, okay, this is the reason why I, I took these seven. Uh, the scaffolds uh, for uh, as inspiration for my uh, for my work of art. Uh, there is no uh, claim that these seven executions are in any way connected. Uh, but I think actually they are. Uh, they share one uh, important characteristic, and that is simply that the existence of an image of them, because otherwise he could not have used them for his, uh, his work of art. So after John Brown, it is in 1862 the execution of. 38 Sioux Indians in Minnesota, which was the largest uh, mass execution in U.S. history. Uh, the third is the so-called Four Lincoln Conspirators, uh, which was the first private execution indoors uh, in the old Arsenal Penitentiary in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1865. Then the scaffold of four anarchists in 1887 in Chicago after the so-called Haymarket Massacre, which actually involved mostly a police shooting on uh, the strikers a year earlier. Uh, the fifth is that that was also a execution indoors. The fifth that he was inspired by is the execution of a person called Rainy Bethia in 1936. That was the last public execution in the United States, in Owensboro, Kentucky. That Rainy Bethia was a black man of 26 convicted for raping a white woman of 17. Uh, then the so the execution of a person named Billy Bailey in 1996. No exact date recorded, but this was in 1996 occurred the last public, uh, no, sorry, not public, uh, the last hanging, the last uh, death penalty by hanging in the United States. So he didn't have a, an image actually of this execution of Billy Bailey, but he had one of the uh, of the hanging scaffold of, of Delaware where it occurred. And the seventh was the uh, execution of Saddam Hussein in on December 30, 2006. Now this opens up, already opens up some discussion or this question of theory uh, because as I said, and as Sam Durant claims, these were all American executions. Uh, and he simply says that, well, the uh, present Iraqi state would not have been there without American intervention. Uh, so that's why he arranges this with, uh, with an, among the American executions. I guess uh, all of us would agree with the fact that the Iraqi state, present Iraqi state, would not be there without American intervention. But there could still be some debate on whether this uh, makes it justified to call it an American execution. Now let's go to a second structure by Sam Durand. This is the same work of art, but it was installed again. And it was installed again in the Netherlands, in The Hague. Um, there was a manifestation there in uh, the fall of 2013 and spring of 2014, which I believe was occasioned by the uh, 
the 100th anniversary of the uh, inauguration of the Peace Palace in The Hague, which was inaugurated in 1913 uh, on the eve of the First World War, but still, it is still there and it was more recently followed by, uh, by a lot of uh, in so-called international buildings which uh, are s supposed to promote, uh, have to do with promoting peace, so The Hague uh, advertises itself at least as a city of peace as the city of international justice. Actually on the picture, well, work on, on the bench at the water, that's, that's why I like the picture, but you can't, cannot see it even if you would magnify the picture, but there's, there's Giselle, my wife, and me sitting on the, on the bench. Uh, uh, I know that we're sitting there, I can recognize us, but uh, you couldn't see it even if I would magnify the picture. Uh, but so that's why I know that this was on the day of the uh, installation of the scaffold in uh, the of scaffold in the Hague. And to the right, there you see just the on the edge of the so-called international district, uh, with, where all these buildings like the Peace Palace and the International Criminal Court uh, are are located. So this at least provides me with a justification for returning at the end of my lecture, returning to the theme of international justice. Uh, in general, and the, the International Criminal Court in particular. But let me first go back to history, because that's, I guess, for, for what you have asked me to, uh, to speak here. Uh, a little recapitulation, which I again want to do briefly, because uh, uh, what's, what are the theoretical contexts or theoretical backgrounds against which you can view the history of capital punishment? And from a long time ago, of course, the first uh, I was uh, some of you may know, I've usually been inspired by the, the theories of Norbert Elias in, uh, in my work. And so the first, uh, and, and the especially two uh, theories of him involved as, as a context uh, for uh, uh, viewing, for, for thinking about the history of, of capital punishment and penal system uh, generally. And the first one, which, which I have already used in, from, from long ago in uh, in my work is that of uh, process of civilization or civilizing processes if you want. Yeah, so the word recapitulation must be taken literal, literally here. I will talk only briefly about it. Um, it is symbolized visually here in the two images that you see of the two images of Amsterdam's gallows field. Uh, there was a, uh, a practice of uh, displaying the corpses of those carefully executed, not necessarily all of them, but usually at least in, in Amsterdam history it was an aggravation in the, the sentence of capital, a possible aggravation in the sentence of capital convicts. And again, traditionally the idea was that this would, would contribute to, uh, well, what, what lawyers call general prevention, to uh, warning people this can happen to you if you had, that's what, what the ladies, uh, the ladies uh, to the left uh, low say, say to the little child there, uh, look, these are bad people that are hanging there, and if you, uh, if you do not obey your parents, and further on in your life go into the, the wrong path and become a criminal, that is what may happen to you. Now this was, uh, you discontinued throughout the, the turn of the, uh, of the, the 18th and 19th centuries in most European uh, countries, in the Netherlands in 1795 with the Italian Revolution. And the, the, to the right is a drawing actually made, a historical drawing around 1860 by someone who had an old picture, who perhaps uh, had the picture, uh, the, the image to the left in front of him. Uh, and for him, it was kind of the eerie things of the past. Uh, he doesn't, uh, he presents the convicts hanging there in a much more uh, non-visible fashion and the uh, on the pillars there on the on the left it is authentic these are lions with the the, uh, the city's coat of arms so symbolizing the power of the city and the city's justice but he has turned them into vultures Okay, for, for the rest, uh, as I said, I have published on this amply before, but let me just emphasize again here that you should not see it that the civil process of civilization are in a way the cause of the privatization of punishment or penal changes generally. 
this is not the way that Elias' theory works. His theory is about interdependent processes, so I would rather say um, that the, the privatization of executions and the, the reduced role uh, of physical of physicality in the penal system uh, generally are an expression of process of civilization. Uh, this is how you see interdependent processes change in one social realm causes a change in the other and this goes back to the first realm and so on. It's uh, again so this should could be the subject of quite a quite a, a separate lecture, but I won't let me just emphasize it here. As I said, uh, uh, from the theories of Norbert Elia, not only process of civilization, but more recently I have come to realize that uh, a lot of uh, changes in the penal system over the centuries, uh, and especially also in more recent times, uh, can be uh, directly linked to a second theory of uh, Norbert Elias, and that is the uh, gradual, what he calls the decrease of power differentials, when societies get more uh, differentiated, more complex uh, in various ways with state systems and more uh, differentiated economic systems, then gradually the, uh, the, the, the power differences between uh, uh, all kinds of social groups, between higher and upper classes, between men and women, between generally in his uh, theory between established groups and between outsider groups, these power differentials they tend to decrease. They, there may be temporary upsurges again of an increase in power differentials, but over the long term they tend to decrease. Now, uh, it is perhaps, uh, I, I, you may perhaps allow me to dwell a little bit on how I came to realize the importance of the, the, the uh, how I came to realize that this is also a major theme in, uh, in penal history, also from a rather early time because somehow my fellow speaker, uh, David Garland, is indirectly involved in, uh, in this process of, re of re realization. Only indirectly, David, but anyway, first, uh, because uh, this, this image, I may start with this image. Uh, this is, I've scanned this from a book that would pro perhaps not, uh, not have come to my attention if David Garland had not asked me to review it for uh, Punishment and Society uh, some 15 years ago. Uh, by an art historian, Mitchell Murbeck. He, uh, he uh, deals with a theme which art historians call a Calvary, which is a, uh, a crucifixion in, in a landscape with various sorts of people. Uh, what you see here is a detail from one of these pictures that he uh, uh, treats. And these are, these are sort of paintings uh, from the late, uh, mostly from from the late 15th century in various European countries. Uh, these painters were uh, theologically restricted uh, in their depiction of, of Jesus on the cross, but they could give free reign to their imagination in depicting the two persons who were executed with him, uh, which uh, I, as a child, have been taught to call the two murderers, but in English they are called the two thieves which says something also, also, also says something about the vicissitudes of the, the, the history of the death penalty, but let's leave that out. And in this detail, you can see that um, in this case, the, the torments to be endured by one of the two thieves uh, have been modeled by the contemporary penalty of breaking on the wheel, which involved uh, uh, eight, well, anyway, breaking on the wheel which is not a nice thing for if you're subjected to it. And that finally leads uh, Murbeck to say, okay, the convicts, the, there was a kind of change, uh, there, there was a an, an, an kind of uh, identification, at least in people's thoughts, of the, the, the crucifixion of Christ and the execution of common criminals, which indeed theologians like Jean Giet de Jean Jesson, the Paris theologian, had already said in, in around 1400s, something like, mind you, don't despise criminal convicts who are killed on the scaffold because uh, uh, Christ, they all remind us of the crucifixion of Christ. Now, um, 
when I had just when I had just uh, finished the uh, the review of this book by Murbeck, I went to a conference in Germany, and there I met the German uh, medievalist Peter Schuster, and he had a, a paper about the transformation that he had uh, found in just by looking at archival documents, which again show that in many parts of Europe there was a transition, a, a clear transformation in the image of uh, capital concretes in the Middle Ages, or during most of the Middle Ages, they were considered as completely worthless persons. Uh, they were not, were, did not even deserve uh, the sacrament of uh, the last sacrament uh, to uh, die as, as penitents. Uh, sometimes uh, popes uh, insisted that they should, but usually they were not given the, uh, the opportunity to confess and uh, executions were completely secular in tone, uh, even though this was a Christian society in the Middle Ages. Uh, executions did not have a religious element. And this, uh, uh, finally, by the end of the Middle Ages and into the mid 16th century, there was a transformation by, by which a lot of religious ritual entered the theater uh, of the scaffold. Uh, where the, the emphasis next to the fact of deserved punishment and here the state uh, or the, the court and the city does justice uh, and this is all very uh, uh, very correct to do but even those uh, these malefactors who have done such heinous things that, that they deserve to be executed even those persons uh, uh, can be uh, God will accept these persons in heaven if uh, if they, if they repent. Now from then on this struck me as, a, as an important transformation but I was not quite sure for which it was important and my realization also started indirectly with David Garland who wrote me in I think in 2008 or 2009 and said I'm, I'm uh, working on a new book on the death penalty and uh, here I have the major changes in European history uh, regarding the death penalty, I think there were 14, and uh, asked my comments on it, and then I said, well, I, I think this is pretty much what indeed what had happened, but there's one early transformation that I now think important, uh, and that is not uh, also not included in my earlier writing about the subject. Uh, then I was asked to contribute to a collection uh, on capital punishment, uh, an American collection, which came out in 2011, uh, prepared by a conference in 2010, uh, that was uh, half half a year later, and then I suddenly realized, yeah, I can take up this theme, and of course I can link it with Iliad theory of the decrease of power differentials. And then I was very concerned. Oh my God! Did I just have told David Garland about this transformation? Perhaps it figures in his book, but it came out between the <coughs> workshop and the actual publication, and I saw to my uh, relief that there was nothing on this transformation in David's book, so I could happily uh, could, pub I could publish myself about it. Why does it link up with the decrease of power differential? That is all, again implicit in the work of Murbeck. Hey, he says so it was a kind of higher status for uh, higher status for the condemned after this transformation. And they all reminded one of Jesus' execution, which at least, even though they were still considered dishonorable convicts, was still a kind of implementation, a slight implementation of their status. And that, of course, also involved a slight increase in their power, simply because they can spoil the show, or they can threaten to spoil the show by not being penitent on the scaffold, by threatening to display defiance instead of penitence. Yeah, let me end the theme of power differentials finally by the, uh, about the same time or just after uh, that I published about it, uh, it was uh, confirmed uh, or indirectly confirmed in a few publications. One was a book by Danish historian Tunde Krok who writes about uh, indirect suicide or, or suicide murder as he calls it, uh, people who commit, who usually murder someone else's child uh, because they have a, a death wish and they have scruples against direct suicide so they murder someone else's child uh, well yeah, I suddenly realized that this reminds me a bit of the recent events of the, the airplane crash in, in the Alps but this was surely not a child but 150 uh, 
people of all ages. But in in the past, it sometimes in the early modern period, it sometimes happened that people with, who wanted to, to well be dead, but not literally to uh, uh, to commit suicide, killed someone else's child uh, uh, in order to be executed, which they usually were, because this is obviously a crime which would, where general prevention would. Uh, be benefited by making it non-capital, but that was unthinkable in the, in the early modern period. Krog links is also to the uh, to the the, 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 the the religiously tinged executions that were common in the early modern periods. He goes a bit too far because we know that this uh, indirect suicide was especially common in Lutheran countries. Uh, he thinks that it was that even religiously tinged executions were only there in Lutheran countries, which is clearly, uh, which I know is clearly against the evidence. Uh, but he does make a, an argument that Lutheran doctrine especially fostered this, because in Lutheran doctrine, everyone who repents surely will go to heaven. So common people in Lutheran countries in the 17th and 18th centuries, they believed that execution earned you a, a, a sure a free ticket to heaven. The other, and I think, uh, because I realized that I cannot speak too fast in English, so I figured that uh, to you, uh, so I figured that I would rather sometimes skip something than uh, very quickly uh, mention it. So let, let me go uh, uh, again, if only to be true to the comparative perspective that I have in the title of my lecture. Um, this second, yeah, I. One thing that I didn't say, uh, you had the credit for uh, identifying this transformation must go primarily to Mitchell Murbeck and Peter Schuster, but I can take the credit for, for the term itself, the sacralization of executions. Uh, they didn't uh, give the, this transformation a name, so I, I did sacralization of executions at first. Actually, in this uh, first version of my article about it, I uh, called it the Christianization of executions, but then I realized that even though we had previously executions were completely secular, this st still took place in a society that was devoutly Christian, so that Christianization would not be a good term. But when I changed it to sacralization, again, I realized that this also offered the opportunity to investigate uh, whether, by myself or by others, whether a transformation like this secularization of executions perhaps also occurred or whether it did not occur in other societies. Now, there's one parallel that, that I came to know of at about the same time by reading about the Aztec ritual sacrifices. And I think these offer a parallel. Not a one-on-one -on -one equation, of course. Sacrifice is, is, after all, something else than, than executions. But I think they offer a parallel. Uh, take, for example, the uh, the uh, inauguration of what came to be their their temple, which came to be known by the the uh, Spanish uh, name of Templo Mayor, was dedicated in 1487. Um, 10, about 10,000 uh, people richly sacrificed. That was an exception, by the way. Uh, that, that was a special occasion. So uh, with uh, extra numbers. So I've been intrigued that at about the same time when executions started to get sacralized in uh, several European uh, countries, uh, the Aztecs had these also religious, theatrical religious rituals, which were not really executions, but somehow comparable to them. Obviously, in 1487, the societies in question were unknown to each other, so the temporal coincidence uh, must really be considered a coincidence, but I think there is a structural coincidence here that in both cases, and with the Aztec Empire and with the various European monarchies, you had uh, developing, uh, emerging, emerging states, emerging modern states, that relied on, on religiously tinged uh, rituals. With the Aztecs, though, it was mostly prisoners of war, and they were believed to have led an honorable life. So this is a, a, a clear, clear contrast with the conflicts uh, and the secularized executions in, in European history. 
incidentally, for me, this also this this parallel also settles the question. And there's been much discussion about how to view uh, Aztecs uh, ritual sacrifices. Should they be considered uh, uh, sanctioned murder, uh, or should they be considered uh, something that the, uh, the the victims engaged in voluntarily because they believed it was good for their soul, or something like that? Uh, it settles the matter because it was. State, to me, it was state violence, both the religiously tinged executions that came about in Europe and the Aztec ritual sacrifices were state violence. But there's also a non-parallel, again, something that, uh, that work, this is from the work of Jérôme Bourgon, of a French sinologist that came to my attention just after I had published on the secularization of executions. In China, the, the secularization of execution simply did not take place. The, the China had secular and unceremonial execution throughout the imperial period. Their term for execution, their most common term for execution is kishi, which literally means uh, being thrown away or abandoned in a marketplace. So you can immediately draw draw one conclusion here, and the secularization of executions is a possible but not a necessary element in the tra trajectory of state formation. What you see represented here is the, the ultimate penalty in, in China throughout the uh, Ming and Qing dynasties until its abolition in 1905, uh, which was called Ling Chu which has been translated, not very accurately, but sensationally, as death by a thousand cuts. Uh, but in fact, as uh, Bourgon shows, there were eight, I believe, eight to ten cuts. Uh, so what you see represented here, and with, usually with the convict uh, already dead or half dead, what you see represented here is the second cut. And I must, even though I have time to go 16, it's not very the light is not very good there, so let me say this accurately. The second cut in the chest and the fifth cut in the left leg. Uh, now, onlookers, onlookers found it very, uh, they found it very, bar around the turn of the century, found it very barbaric, which is intriguing because they had uh, European onlookers who had just left public executions behind in their own country and in France, not even then. Um, but they found they were especially shocked because of the fact that there was no, re and no religious or moral ceremonial. And therefore, they thought that all the Chinese spectators who were, to, who were there, and not as a complete audience, but who were there, they thought them all indifferent, which again, uh, Bourgon shows with uh, his photograph that this was, uh, that this was not true. Okay, so this is again the second the second contextual or theoretical element with which you can view penal history and the history of capital punishment in particular, where I sort of uh, elaborated this with a little uh, extra European comparison. Let me just say that I also recently learned that in the kingdom of the Ashanti, in present-day Ghana, in the late 19th century, uh, executions also had a were accompanied by a religious ceremonial, but it is not known whether these were secular uh, or secular executions before. Now here a third element that is um, that I haven't published about yet that I think is new, but which I recently came to realize that you can also view as a background to uh, penal history. The offender-victim balance, as it says there, or more accurately perhaps, the shifting balances between attention paid to the perpetrators of crimes, of offenses, and the victims of crimes. And I emphasize the element of shifting balances, because here it's not really like a, a very neat long-term process that can be represented as going that direction or in that direction. Uh, there is, uh, at various times, there are various, uh, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the, the attention, most of the attention goes to the offender, sometimes 
more attention goes to the victims of crime. But this is again a subject that can be, uh, at least can be studied over the long term. <laughs> I emphasize also that this is a recent realization, so I would also not yet, uh, not yet know exactly how to tie this more firmly to particular theories of Norbert Elias, but let's go here. Um, if we go back to the Middle Ages, uh, before the, uh, when executions were rather, uh, uh, rather seldom events, but they were still uh, rather secular, uh, events, but executions were, uh, especially they were rather rare. Uh, what was much more common, for example, was to, uh, that victims, crime victims, or victims of wrong, uh, so it's not uh, the offender victim balance, uh, perhaps that you always have these two parties in criminal justice, but criminal justice is not always there, but if you uh, uh, broaden that criminal justice to include all systems of redressing wrongs, uh, then you still have, uh, uh, in all cases, you have at least a party of the victim and a party of the offender. Uh, in the Middle Ages, there were there were much more room for people either to, to for the, uh, the the victims or their, uh, the victims for me includes uh, when they are dead, includes their family or other representatives who help you take revenge for them, so there was much room for taking revenge or for private reconciliation and people giving uh, financial compensation or uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, uh, a murder victim, uh, uh, that they take measures that enhance the chances of the murder victim's soul in heaven, uh, which at least I believe to benefit the, the victim. As much for room for that, but then uh, with the age of of the spectrum of suffering, it's really the offender is essential. The victim goes into the background as a consequence of the rise of modern states who want to reduce vengeance, who want to reduce the feuding, uh, who redefine all wrongs as crimes, which is primarily, uh, crime is primarily something directed against uh, the state, against public authority, uh, and not against the victim. So the victim really gets into the background. On the scaffold, you see the offender, everyone sees him or her, but the victim perhaps only figures in passing in the story of the, of the offenses that is told at the occasion of the execution. And this is symbolized, especially in Germany, where, where, these, where, the, where the, the convict in these re religiously tinged executions is called the Arme Sünder, the poor sinner. Uh, that's what he or she is called in Germany, and this actually continues, and that is uh, that is why I took this picture, uh, uh, which symbolizes that this central role of the offender in the, in redressing wrongs in the criminal justice system continues well into the 20th century. It continues into the 19th century, where there was much enthusiasm for solitary confinement, and it continues into the 1950s to 1970s in the form of a relative leniency for offenders very often in many uh, of these European countries uh, where offenders were often uh, in the 1950s to 1970s were very often considered as themselves a kind of victims uh, in this case of uh, bad social circumstances so this continuation into the uh, uh, over the middle of the uh, of the 20th century is symbolized in the picture here because the person uh, the person uh, leading the Armazunde is, is not, a, not an early modern executioner, but a, looks like a policeman around 1900. And the, the real turn comes towards the, uh, the last decades of the 20th century uh, with uh, modern punitiveness, which is generally uh, something that by many criminologists and historians has been recognized uh, as, at least since the 1980s, uh, when most Western societies uh, have become uh, more punitive again, and in an art again in the article where I started with the secularization of executions, I ended with this modern punitiveness, so I can perhaps just refer to that, where the, my main conclusion was that it was accompanied by what I called it 
a civilizing spirit in the form of greater concern uh, within the criminal justice system, but also in society at large, greater concern and a greater attention for crime victims. Now, this last, this more modern, uh, I have analyzed this more modern uh, turn in, uh, in my farewell lecture at Erasmus University, which uh, I was, uh, well, I had to retire officially in 2013, so then you give, a, at least at Dutch University, you give a farewell lecture, uh, and I realized that this was exactly 50 years after the breakthrough of the Beatles, so I thought I must do something with this. Um, and I put myself to the uh, somewhat megaloman megalomaniac task, at least for the Netherlands, for Dutch history alone, of charting the major social changes in, in Dutch society since from 1963 to, 19, to, to, to 2013 and their repercussions for the image of, uh, of criminals, of offenders and victims. Now, this, has been, uh, this uh, lecture has been published in Dutch only, so this is probably new to you. And again, since it is a whole lecture, I can only give to you today the, the, the major conclusions. I identified five uh, themes concerning the general changes in Dutch society in these 50 years. The, the first was the connected themes of depolarization and secularization. They are connected because uh, they you usually have these four pillars, the Catholics, Protestants, uh, the Socialists, and the, the more general liberal pillar. Uh, so depolarization is not the same as secularization, but the decline of the influence of the Protestant and Catholic churches uh, caused the uh, erosion of two of the pillars, and with it also the uh, decline of the whole system. Further, I spoke about stages in youth culture, authority relations, about the women's movement and sexuality, and I'll just leave it at that. Perhaps I'll work. I, I work. Perhaps I'll work. I'll work this out once for a, a, an English publication in English. And I identified four repercussions, which you see uh, written there. Where one, uh, three, and four are simply uh, represent an increase, yeah, more attention to crime in the media, uh, and so on. And number two, image of criminals means a kind of shift from a more neutral and sometimes positive image. In the, early, the first half of the 1970s, uh, a person named Age M, uh, a master burglar uh, with a thermic lance, uh, had very much sympathy in the country, so he was probably the last uh, criminal, uh, last very known criminal in the Netherlands who had a, a largely positive uh, image, uh, but that changed into a rather negative image uh, for uh, offenders. Uh, a separate tendency that, that I also identified was that it was an increasing wish, not only uh, a greater concern for victims, but also an increasing wish to identify victims, to see victims everywhere, even if perhaps they themselves did not consider themselves necessarily as victims, and this applies especially to prostitutes who, uh, despite what the exact law was at, at a particular time, were in this, in this 50 years increasingly, uh, all of them were increasingly seen as, as victims of other people, of groups, brutal exploiters or whatever. The turning point really was the 1980s. Uh, yeah, this is a slogan that I like to use. It's a very indirect link, but if you put all the, the changes that I identified together, you can even, uh, in the 1980s, you have the end of the sexual revolution and a start and the increase of the increase of income difference. I consider that important because it usually links, like uh, in, in the Netherlands, it was 1983 was the year when income differences uh, started to get larger again, when they had sort of, they had become uh, smaller for, for a long time, but then they started to increase again. And this is usually, by sociologists, usually linked this to the process of globalization, so the uh, more or less erosion of the nation state uh, through globalization. Uh, and this has to do, I believe, also with uh, power differences, which are increasing again. Now, let me emphasize that again in this analysis. Uh, uh, that's why I have this 
uh, element of authority relations there. This is also to do with, with power, but this has to do with the micro level authority relations for, between teachers and their pupils or between uh, tram, uh, tram conductors or controllers and the public. Uh, on, the make, on the micro level, the decrease of power differences has continued, but on the macro level, especially that uh, ex, uh, that goes beyond the nation state connected to globalization uh, has led to an increase of income differences, uh, which also brought with it the, the, the decreasing power of lawbreakers or, or convicts. That is at least my hypothesis or my theory, whatever you wish here. Okay, let me end with a few, finally, since I mentioned globalization already and the, the erosion a little bit of the nation state, which also uh, makes it difficult to, perhaps more problems to, uh, to make the clear distinction that the nation state made possible for a long time between state violence and non-state violence, or between uh, violence and punishment, uh, when I analyze uh, a knife fight in Amsterdam 300 years ago uh, where one, uh, one of the fighters is killed uh, and the other one is then tried and decapitated. It is obvious to me that the, the death in a knife fight concerns uh, private violence, uh, really interpersonal violence, and that the decapitation is state violence or punishment. Uh, now, in, in my abstract, and I don't know whether my abstract has been distributed, in my abstract I just put the question, uh, is the, are the decapitations by IS or ISIS or ISIL, uh, as I hear President Obama still saying, which then gets subtitled as IS uh, in, on Dutch television, but anyway, are these, uh, are these murders, terrorist murders, or are they uh, uh, punishments? Uh, criminal justice by an aspiring state. I want just to leave it at the question, just to leave it, leave you with the question here. Let me add just that uh, I recently saw on, uh, on Facebook uh, uh, a video of a, of a decap of, uh, decapitation by knife of a lot of people on a beach. And that was at night when I just, before going to sleep, I consulted my Facebook. I actually thought it was fake because I thought IS has no beach. It must be in Lebanon, they're not there, but the next day I learned in the news that it was in Libya by some group uh, claiming to be connected to the Islamic State. So again, you may ask here, uh, is uh, the territory of the, of the aspiring Islamic State, is it, uh, does it extend to Libya just because the leaders of a group holding power there uh, say so? Let me end by putting the same question uh, for uh, distinction between violence and punishment and, and applying the question to the very distant past and to the possible future. Uh, for the very distant path, uh, past here, uh, this actually stems from my, uh, another recent interest of mine in, uh, in prehistory, in very early history of, uh, of humans, of, of our species, uh, which uh, there's a growing literature which reconstructs uh, uh, various itineraries, various aspects of, of the earliest history of, of mankind through the reconstructions from the DNA of living persons. Uh, and it has been established for sure, for, uh, for example, that the first uh, trek out of Africa, starting some 60,000 years ago, went straight for Australia, or actually for a continent which uh, present-day scholars call Sahul, uh, because this was at a time when uh, the much uh, glaciation was much uh, stronger uh, at, at about the, uh, one of the peaks in uh, the glacial period, so sea level was much lower, and uh, New Guinea was connected to, uh, to Australia, also Tasmania, but that was less uh, relevant for reaching it. Now, it's generally agreed, what you see on the map below, uh, with the sea levels by then, even though uh, this occurred through island hopping. Uh, for example, uh, even though it could be the northern routes would seem to be more, uh, more feasible, uh, many people assume that also across the, uh, the, Timor, the Timor Strait, which is a deep trough, which surely 
has always been uh, an ocean, uh, which is about uh, even at the height of, uh, of even at the lowest sea levels, it was about 80 kilometers. Uh, uh, it's assumed that this has been done on a bamboo raft. Uh, but I just, uh, my point is again, violence or punishment may have played a part here. The factors in the literature that I, that I usually mentioned are uh, demographic pressures, overpopulation, which is always a good reason to assume for, for historians or else quest for adventure, or sheer accidents when they were fishing near the coast on such a raft and drifted away. But I simply put a question at some point, why not violence or punishment here? Why perhaps over a thousand years uh, recurrently people were placed on a raft uh, just to go and, and driven into the sea and finally after a thousand years one of these rafts made it to Sahul, present day Australia and uh, started the population of the Australian Aborigines. If you ask violence or punishment here I would in this case opt for the word violence because again I think, but I'm not sure, but I believe that these people did not yet have a conception of uh, a community reaction to a perceived wrong. But it is of course different that here I'll definitely end my talk with uh, the future, the possible future. Does the future of uh, punishment lie in international justice? Surely the uh, authorities of The Hague uh, uh, want it to be and The Hague at its center, that, that's uh, clear enough. But you can pose various questions here again. Uh, for one thing, uh, this means that if, uh, if you have new crimes like crimes against humanity or uh, hey, genocide or whatever, uh, this usually means, so if you have new courts, you also have new crimes. Uh, now you have an international criminal court and you have the crimes against humanity in the 16th century. You had new marital or, or sexual courts, and they had new crimes of uh, adultery, dancing, and what have you. So, new court usually means also new crimes, hence, hence process of criminalization. And you may also ask the question of selective justice. And for one thing, the United States does not uh, recognize the International Criminal Court, which, again, in the, in the Dutch media, was a very big thing because. Uh, in theory, the United States threatens to invade the Netherlands uh, wh uh, whenever uh, the, the International Criminal Court uh, would have has captured an American citizen and wants to, to try him or her. Uh, and there's another thing. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, what the most persons by now who have been tried by the International Criminal Court, they are the, the leaders of weak or failed states. And uh, again, some, sometimes I learned from, from the news that in Africa in particular, there are already voices uh, considering the International Criminal Court as an anti-African instrument. Incidentally, this reminds me of something that I wanted to have said when I talked about the Aztecs, uh, but I forgot, but I'm, I'm telling you now. Had the Aztecs lived today and practiced their ritual sacrifices, this would probably be considered a matter for the International Criminal Court. And no doubt, as some of the Aztecs would complain about the grave disregard for their culture involved. Okay, well, finally, and here I end, a, a, a real international criminal justice would depend on an international monopoly of force. And of course, there is no worldwide international monopoly of force. So this would always make it vulnerable to criticism like from these Africans of selective, uh, selective justice. Okay, let me end on this note. <laughs>